morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the session on uh, new directions in obesity management. My name is uh, Gabriella Lieberman from Tel Aviv, and along with me is Dr. Uh, Bernard Ludwig from Austria, and we will be chairing the session together. Before we start, I'd like to uh, ask you to fill out the survey on health professionals active in the field of obesity, self-assessing the treatment of sexual problems in obese patients that you can find on your chairs, and these will be collected on your way out. Thank you very much. So, I'd like, we'd like to start by inviting Dr. John Wilding from the UK to show us the results of a randomized phase two placebo an active controlled dose ranging study of semaglutide for the treatment of obesity in subjects without diabetes. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Vienna to present these uh, data to you, uh, which are from this uh, phase two study of semaglutide for the treatment of obesity in people uh, without diabetes. Uh, these are my disclosures. This study was, of course, funded by Novo Nordisk, uh, and I do work uh, with Novo Nordisk along with a number of other pharmaceutical companies in obesity and diabetes research. So I think everybody here will recognize that we have limited pharmacological options to help uh, treat uh, people with obesity, um, and also that the GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, have, we already have one uh, approved uh, for the treatment of obesity, and of course they're very widely used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. One of the most recently available GLP-1 analogs for diabetes, uh, which is now approved in, in the United States and a number of other countries, is semaglutide, uh, but so far we, uh, until now, we have not seen any data on semaglutide for weight management, for which of course it's not currently approved. So the aim and objectives of this study uh, were to assess the efficacy and safety of semaglutide to promote weight loss in people with obesity who do not have diabetes. So the primary endpoint of this study is uh, weight loss, uh, change in body weight and percentage at week 52. And as you might expect, we look at a number of other important measures, including uh, waist circumference, uh, measures of glucose metabolism, and cardiovascular risk factors such as blood pressure and lipids. The primary analysis of this study uses uh, an ANCOVA model with a number of uh, factors in the model and uses uh, a very conservative intention to treat based approach, uh, which uh, uses multiple imputation to account for missing data. Uh, and this is very important uh, because it means that the data that you see, uh, the way that they're modeled, are the most conservative analysis uh, that you would do for any sort of weight loss study. So I'm now going to show you the trial design. So this was a multinational, double-blind, placebo-controlled study with also an active comparator, which is liraglutide at the dose of three milligrams, which is, of course, already approved for the treatment of obesity. Uh, and the study lasted uh, one year. We recruited 957 people uh, from eight different countries, and the inclusion criteria are a BMI above 30, age more than 18 years of age, uh, and having at least one previous attempt to lose weight. Uh, we excluded people with uh, diabetes. As you can see, uh, there were nine different arms in this study. There is a uh, placebo with both liraglutide and semaglutide uh, doses. So these patients had to inject uh, two twice per day, once with uh, semaglutide or placebo, and once with liraglutide or placebo. There was a liraglutide three milligram daily dose and five different doses escalating of semaglutide. Um, and this was given uh, on a daily basis. And the reason for this uh, was related to the expected pharmacokinetics at the time when this trial was being designed, 
we didn't have all the information available from the phase three program uh, with semaglutide in diabetes, which is of course given weekly. Escalation of dose was done every four weeks uh, for those five groups. There was also uh, two groups at the higher doses where there was a faster escalation of semaglutide treatment, but I'm not going to share that data with you in detail today. All of the people in the study underwent, uh, were supported in terms of lifestyle intervention with a 500 kilocalorie deficit diet and a recommendation to increase their physical activity levels uh, to uh, at least 150 minutes per week. So these were the baseline characteristics of the people who took part in the study. 35% um, of participants were male, 73% uh, were white, and 86% were non-Hispanic. The average age was 47 years. This was a relatively high level of obesity in this population with an average weight of 111 kilos, an average BMI of 39, and a waist circumference of 118 centimeters. I think a really important part of this trial was the work that was done by each of the centers to ensure that people remained in the trial. And you'll be aware that a lot of trials for uh, weight management, uh, we have a very high dropout rate. Here, uh, we have over 80% of people in the study remained on their assigned treatment at week 52, with only 18% discontinuing treatment. Of those uh, patients who discontinued treatment, uh, just under two-thirds of them returned at week 52 for body weight management measurement. So that means that we actually had body weight measurements of 93% of people in the study at the end of the study, which of course minimizes uh, the problems that we often see uh, with lost and missing data in trials of uh, treatments for people with obesity. So let's move on now and look at uh, the primary outcome of the study, which is changing body weight at week 52. You can see here that the group of people who were treated uh, with uh, diet and lifestyle achieved a 2.3% weight loss, loraglutide a 7.8% weight loss, which is completely consistent with the scale program of loraglutide for the treatment of obesity. And then there is a, a, a very nice dose response uh, for the five different semaglutide groups. Uh, and I'd like to highlight particularly the 13.8% weight loss seen at the highest dose of 0.4 milligrams daily. If we look at this uh, same information on the weight loss curves, uh, I think the most important thing to see from this is, as you might expect, uh, with uh, the placebo treatment, also with the lower doses of uh, semaglutide, uh, patients appear to reach a plateau in body weight around about uh, the middle of the study, uh, whereas in those uh, people treated with the higher doses of semaglutide, we are seeing ongoing weight loss, which uh, continues and is still ongoing uh, at the end of the study. <coughs> Another important aspect when we're looking at uh, treatment is to look at categorical weight loss. And what you can see here is that if we look at 5% weight loss at the higher doses, over 80% of semaglutide treated patients achieved a 5% weight loss compared to 66% with uh, loraglutide uh, and 23% uh, with placebo. Greater than 10% weight loss was achieved in over 50% at the three higher doses uh, of loraglutide compared to 34% uh, with, uh, with semaglutide, sorry, compared to 34% with loraglutide and 10% with placebo. We also, in an exploratory analysis, having seen these very impressive results, looked at the proportion of patients who achieved 15 and 20% weight loss. And here you can see uh, between 30 and 40% of people at the higher doses achieved a weight loss of at least 15%. And we actually had 27% of participants achieving a 20% weight loss on the highest dose of semaglutide. In terms of changes in cardiovascular risk factors and glucose metabolism, we saw improvements in blood pressure, 
lipid profile, and also high sensitive CRP in all the dosing groups with no clear indication of dose dependence. But we should remember that this was uh, a group of people who did not have diabetes, they were normotensive, and generally had well controlled risk factors at baseline. As we see with all GLP-1 receptor agonists, we saw a modest, modest increase in heart rate at, somag at, all, at somaglutide doses above uh, 0.05 milligrams per day. This was also seen with loraglutide 3 milligrams, and there was no clear effect of dose. As you might expect, with a drug that has effects on glucose metabolism, there were small reductions in HbA1c, but remembering this is a group of people who had really normal HbA1c at baseline. In terms of adverse events, uh, we saw uh, quite a high rate of adverse event reporting, but that was also true even in the placebo group, uh, and that's what you expect when you study people with obesity over, over a year. And the most striking difference here is, of course, in GI adverse events, uh, which were much higher with all the active treatment groups around between 70 and 80 uh, percent, compared to placebo at 38 percent. In terms of serious adverse events, uh, there was no clear association of the number of events with uh, dose. And the most common GI-related adverse event was nausea. If we look at treatment discontinuation due to GI adverse events, you can see that these were generally quite low, a little bit higher with the uh, 0.4 milligram semaglutide group, but nevertheless this was uh, only around 10% of people in the study. In general, these discontinuations were not dose dependent. And if we look at nausea, um, perhaps you can see here, as you would expect, we start with the loraglutide group, uh, you see this nausea at the beginning of the study, which tends to decline over time. Uh, and we see a very similar pattern with all of the doses of semaglutide uh, and also uh, a relatively low rate of nausea, as you might expect with placebo. Very few severe events, and as, you've, as I've shown you, very few events leading to withdrawal. I haven't shown you the detailed data for the fast escalation arms, but there were no consistent differences in efficacy or discontinuations, and the safety profile was similar to the slow escalation arms. So to conclude, in this study of people with obesity without type, type 2 diabetes, uh, treated with semaglutide on a daily basis, or loraglutide or placebo, uh, we had a very high retention rate in this study, and we were able to demonstrate dose-dependent weight loss uh, which reached 13.8% at week 52 with the highest dose of semaglutide compared to 2.3% on placebo, up to 41% and 27% respectively achieving a 15 and 20% weight loss with semaglutide at the highest dose compared to, of course, much lower rates on placebo. Generally, uh, the drug was well tolerated. There were no new safety issues with the most common adverse event being gastrointestinal. Um, and these data will support the further development of semaglutide as a treatment for people with obesity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wilding. This uh, fascinating paper is now open for discussion. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm a PhD candidate from Canada. Uh, can you please elaborate more on the lifestyle intervention that was provided to all the participants? So everybody in the, in the study uh, saw dietitians on a regular basis throughout the 52 weeks of the study. Uh, they were also given advice about physical activity, but there was no uh, supervised physical activity within the study. Okay, so the, the physical activity was not supervised, and how often did they see the dietitian? They saw the dietitian every, ev every month during the study. And did they only see a dietitian? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so no social worker, nothing like that, no interdisciplinary team? No, it was, it was, it was dietitian and obviously the study physician would also support that advice along with study nurses and everybody else on the team. Okay, and uh, do you have any idea why the 180 or so patients uh, dropped out? Was it just because of the adverse events or were there other reasons? So that's an, that's an interesting question. If you look at the, the people who did uh, drop out from treatment, in fact, we saw higher rates of discontinuation in the placebo group than we did in the active treatment arms. 
Uh, and I think I can show you that uh, information. So if we look at treatment discontinuation, you can see that it's not dose dependent um, and that the highest dropout rates were in people on placebo and on the lowest dose of semaglutide. So I suspect it was lack of weight loss was the main reason for those withdrawals. And I've already shown you uh, the withdrawals that occurred due to uh, GI adverse events. Okay. And can Excuse you elaborate more? Maybe we'll yeah. give a chance to... Oh, sure. I'll just wait then for... My name's Michael Horowitz, I'm from Adelaide. I'm perplexed that you assess GI symptoms by self-report, given that it's known to be highly unreliable and prone to nocebo effects rather than a validated measure. Why did you do this? So everybody was uh, asked specifically about adverse events at each uh, study visit, which were regular throughout the study. Um, uh, you're correct that we didn't use a uh, validated measure, but we do use the standard adverse event reporting uh, 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 terms that are established for all adverse events. And this has been the way uh, that all of the GLP-1 agonists have been assessed in, in clinical trials, both for diabetes and for obesity. That, that's not strictly true. There are some exceptions. But similarly, if you had a drug for functional dyspepsia or, or irritable bowel syndrome, the FDA or European authority would not register your drug. So validated measures are simply available and they should be used. Mm. Okay, well we will take that advice on board, but certainly for uh, loratotide, which is approved for obesity uh, treatment, uh, this type of data collection was considered acceptable by regulatory authorities in the United States and Europe. Okay, I'm sorry for restraints of time, we're gonna have to go on. <coughs> and I'd like to uh, invite my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Dror Dicker. Thank you, Dr. Wilding. Uh, weight loss and alteration in dietary preferences in humans due to reduced of smell by a novel nasal device uh, varies with age. So good, good morning, thank you. Uh, Chair uh, Persons, this is my conflict of inference. I am consult, uh, consultant for the Beck Medical, who sponsors this uh, trial. So we started with a very clinical um, question: Why, when you have sinusitis or upper uh, uh, inspiratory uh, infections, we are less hungry? And we looked into uh, this system and to try to understand. Why is so? So we will know that if we look on the olfactory system, we have the nasal passage, we have the olfactory receptor, and we have the olfactory bulb that you can appreciate that it very much uh, in proximity to the uh, orbital frontal cortex, to the hypothalamus, and to the amygdala. And surprisingly, in the um, olfactory bulb and mucosa, there's the wealth of receptors, receptors of all the orexogenic and unorexogenic signals. And we also know that this relation, this net of connection between olfactory bulb and all the area that controls satiety and appetite is very, very important. So we know that um, leptin and insulin cause satiety by affecting the POMAC. But we also know that this satiety cause decrease in the olfactory sensitivity. And from this um, study, we learned that insulin activates this channel, KV1.3. The activation of this channel cause decrease in olfaction. In the case of obesity and diabetes or insulin resistance, there isn't activation of these channels. So the obese and the insulin resistance patients are more sensitive to olfaction. And in this trial, the knockout mice, the KV13 knockout mice, had much higher sensitive to smell and they um, tend to smell the peanut butter much quicker which not happened in the marble toy. And they concluded that 
KV knockout mice have 10,000 fold fewer threshold for detection of orders and an increased ability to discriminate between orders. In people, in human beings, this gain of function of this channel caused people to be less uh, or more sensitive to smell and to have higher results or better results in glucose indices. They have lower fasting plasma, plasma glucose and lower hemoglobin A1C. And they concluded that, that we observed that genetic variation, meaning gain of function, in this KV 1.3 is associated with decreased olfactory function in healthy humans. Furthermore, we show that olfactory function is dependent on subtle changes in glucose levels. As you see here, the age is very important in smelling and it was adjusted to age. And the reason for this is that through life and especially after the age of 50, the smelling capability is decreasing very steeply. Now in Gerlin, what happened in Gerlin? We know that Gerlin cause, or because of we have fasting, the level of Gerlin is high that produce higher sensitivity and olfaction that cause us to eat more. And in this study in human being, when they injected intravenously gerlin, they increased the capability of smelling or they increased the sensitivity of smelling. So insulin caused blunting of smelling and by this maybe cause us to eat less and gerlin increase the sensitivity of, of smelling and maybe cause us to eat more. And this very recently publication showed that if you ablate the olfactory bulb in mice, you cause those mice that was fed by high fat diet, you cause them to lose weight and to be much more insulin sensitive. So the aim of our study is to determine if a nasal insert would reduce the ability to smell, reduce body weight, alter dietary preferences, and improve metabolic dysfunction. And for this, we used a randomized signal blindness placebo control study of adults with obesity. And we used this nose-nose apparatus. You can appreciate this apparatus. This apparatus direct air to and bypass the olfactory by decreasing smelling. So you insert this apparatus into the nostril and it's direct the air without the smell. So it's drug free and it's discreet. We include um, people between age 18 and 65, BMI 30 to 42. We exclude pregnant women, diabetes, higher blood pressure, thyroid function, and you can see all the exclusion criteria. So we had run in period, two weeks run in period. In this two period, in this two weeks period, they had to reduce the calorie by 500 calories per day and they use this apparatus or saline drops. Those who lost at least half a kilo and used the apparatus could enter the trial which lasts 12 weeks. So the device group were the device between five to 12 hours a day and the control group used saline drops twice a day. All subjects had less 500 calories per day and they used food diary and filled food diary. They also filled eating preference and habits questionnaire that was validated according to this study and we drew their blood in the beginning and the end of the study. In the smelling uh, test we used the N-butanol as was um, described in this study. And the results are. So we had very good randomization. The BMI were 36, very heavy, very obese patients, 50% men and women. The age was around 50, and they didn't have diabetes as was predicted. 
We had 65 participants that uh, ended the study per protocol, 35 in the study group, in the apparatus, 28 in control, control group, and we showed that the apparatus really significantly decreased the smelling. Of course, the drops didn't do it. The weight. So both group did lose weight considerably. The study group lost 6.6% weight and the control group 5.65% of weight. And it was, wasn't really significantly different. But as you remember, the smelling capability changed after the age of 50. So we divided the group by the age, and now you can appreciate that those who were below the age of 50, meaning the smelling capability is still there, lost 7.7% after 12 weeks, compared to 4.1% those who use the control, the drops. And also you can see the significant difference in BMI terms. So the summary, the whole group didn't have a significant difference, but according to the age below 50, 7.7% compared to 4%. In our surprise, we also found that the smelling ablation really had a great effect on food preferences. And you can appreciate again that those who were less than 50 used much less sugar, much less artificial sweeteners, much less sweet beverage, and much less alcoholic beverage just by using this apparatus. Regarding the insulin level, we did find that there was a significant difference in the device when compared to the end, um, start to the end. We didn't find a significant difference in insulin uh, level in the control group, and the difference between the two groups were not significant, but a trend too. Remember that those two groups lost the same amount of weight, so it's not the weight that reduced the, or the increased insulin sensitivity in the device group. And to conclusion, a novel safe administration nasal device that reduced smell caused significant weight loss in subjects below 50 years, reduced dietary preference for sweets, showed the trend in reduced insulin levels without any significant uh, side effects. And I want to conclude with the discussion on this new, very intuitive and very interesting area of olfaction and obesity. Olfaction system and metabolic regulation, is, there is a close relationship and effect on satiety and hunger, food preferences and metabolic function. Obesity cause or a con consequence of olfactory dysfunction, so we don't really know the answer, but there is evidence for both. The difference between food order and non-food order, so people with obesity have increased sensitivity to food orders compared to lean people, and also compared to non-food orders. The effect of olfactory dysfunction on food preferences, so I showed you that yes, mainly reduction in carbohydrate and fattening food. And further study should be conducted to explore this new treatment option and to determine the role of this device for treatment of obesity and diabetes. And by saying that, I want to attention for, the, uh, for your attention. I want to thank you for your attention and to thank all the corporate and the people who participate in the study. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions to Dr. Dicker? Uh, good morning, I'm Raffaella Cancello from uh, Istituto Oxologico in Milano. Thank you for this interesting data and this interesting device. I was wondering if you checked the gustatory threshold in your patient because it seems that uh, they change uh, the taste uh, together with the olfaction that are also linked together. Yeah, very good question. We didn't. We do it in the next 
because it's, it was a pilot study. It's a pilot results. It's really very interesting in new area. So absolutely, taste, it's really smell, okay? We're not tasting, we are smelling. When we're drinking wine in Italy or in all other the world, we really smell the wine, we don't taste. So of course it's, it's correlate and we will planning to do it in the next uh, study. Ah, just it works now. Uh, thank you very much for this clear experience. Uh, I had a trademark uh, that I developed uh, four years ago uh, with the same uh, device. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, I would like to know how can you fix in the nose, uh, because when we prepare this device, uh, was put in the upper part of the uh, of the knees of the nose because uh, in just uh, in the area where the mm, mm, olfactory nerves uh, arise just under the ethmoid and uh, near the upper part uh, of the nose cavity because uh, the uh, the olfactory uh, nerves doesn't cover all the part of the nose so uh, the problem is that uh, for avoiding any possibly uh, troubles according to the presence of the device because the problem of otorhinolaryngologist express a <coughs> clear um, suspect suspicion about the possibility to produce uh, infections uh, in this area which is very, very um, sensible to bacterial and moreover the olfactory nerves uh, must be <coughs> dangered, uh, must be um, destroyed by the infection. So I would like to know how it, you can put and fix uh, for a long time uh, in your experience. Thank you very much. This is the patent, so it's a secret. But we didn't have any infections in our patients. Th thank you, uh, Lesan uh, UAE. Uh, very, very interesting no no novel idea. Um, I just wondered about your placebo arm. How much of a placebo arm is that? I mean, you know, you're sticking uh, n uh, nose drops in, and I know, you know, w w when I when I have some uh, drops in, in my nose, that, that affects my sense of smell and my food preference probably. And and also, if you look look at the two arms. Uh, of the uh, less than 50, so, so you have 4%, was it 4% weight loss, did I get that right, in, in the placebo, and 7% 7, 7 weight loss in your active arm. So I'm just wondering if your placebo was more of a placebo, maybe would that be more pronounced, the difference? Well, it's a good question. When we plan the, the study, we really don't know what will be the placebo, yeah. because you can claim that if you put uh, drops you made more attention on what you're eating, so yeah. like the bracelet, so maybe it's not the placebo, it's the active arm and, yeah. the, and the apparatus is placebo. When we planned it, we didn't know. Of course now, we are knowing, and, and the next uh, uh, study would have to be a more of a placebo. I agree I, with I, I'm this. assuming it was, made, it was uh, a saline and, and yeah. nasal drops, right? Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm going to move on to our third speaker, Dr. Ienka from uh, Sapienza University, Rome, Italy. And she will tell us about virtual follow-up program enhances weight loss results post ellipse balloon and innovative, digital, patient-friendly approach. Thank you so much and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, this is uh, my disclosure. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a topic very often discussed by all obesity specialist physicians, the weight gain. In any way the patient loses weight by diet, pharmacologic, endoscopic or bariatric surgery therapy, how to maintain the weight loss remains the real problem. These are a series of articles and reviews about weight regain after intragastric balloon or bariatric surgery therapy. The inadequate follow-up is identified as the main cause of weight regain in all studies. So, 
Uh, the aim of our study was uh, to evaluate an innovative digital follow-up program in order to maximize the end results uh, and prevent the weight regain in patients treated with the lips balloon. Uh, the lips balloon is enclosed in a capsule and is wallow and filled with uh, 550 milliliters of liquid. This is done at 10 minutes of patient visit without endoscopy or sedation and uh, the balloon is uh, self-emptying via a valve that opens at four mounts, allowing the balloon to pass naturally. Uh, several single and multi-center studies were completed in Europe and in the Middle East uh, in subject with the BMI over 27. And the weight loss range with the balloon are from 10 to 15 percent of total body weight loss with a good weight loss maintenance over one year. Um, the excellent safety profile has been demonstrated in over 5,000 ellipse balloon placed worldwide, and the follow-up has been highly successful because of the use of a connected scale, a smartphone app, whereby the patient was in constant contact with the physician or nutritionist. Uh, this is uh, a video about the lips Alurion balloon. Alurion has developed Ellipse, the first procedureless gastric balloon for weight loss. No surgery, endoscopy, or anesthesia is required. Ellipse is at the core of a six-month weight loss program guided by a team of experts to maximize results. You swallow Ellipse at your doctor's office. Once in the stomach, Ellipse is filled with 550 milliliters of water. From start to finish, the procedure takes under 20 minutes. Your team guides you and helps you learn to eat healthier portions and helps you choose appropriate daily physical activities and a wireless scale connected to your smartphone enables you to track your progress. After approximately four months, the ellipse opens, empties, and is excreted naturally. Your medical team follows you for an additional month to help you consolidate your new eating habits. So uh, this is the design of our study, which included 20 patients uh, treated with the lips balloon. And at the time of balloon excretion, we randomized patients into two groups of 10. Every group received um, a physical follow-up every two weeks for eight months, and only group A received also virtual follow-up. At the time of placement, at the time of excretion, and at the end of the study, we evaluated the anthropometric measures, the body composition, the diet adherence, and the obesity disab correlated disability. Uh, the latter has been uh, evaluated using a test uh, validated in Italy called uh, the obesity correlated disability test uh, that included 36 items divided into seven uh, categories of assessment in order to evaluate the level of disability in obese patients. Uh, these seven sections are pain, stiffness, indoor activities, housework, uh, outdoor activities, occupational activities, and social life. And if the final score is greater than 33%, the patient is considered unable. Also, if the only one item is uh, greater than eight, the patient is uh, considered unable, but only for that specifically function. And in order to evaluate the adherence to the prescribed diet, every patient keeps a three-day food diary uh, that uh, included uh, two working days and one working days in order to avoid uh, possible errors in its compilation and uh, in order to monitor possible change in the prescribed diet. So uh, in our follow-up program, uh, every patient uh, received a technological support that allowed us to be in constant contact with them. In fact, every patient received a weighing scale that was connected via wireless to their mobile phone in order to share their weight and body composition with us at any moment. Furthermore, during the entire period of the treatment, they also received the motivational messages that encouraged them to do physical activity and to follow as closely as possible the diet provided by the nutritionist. 
at the time after the balloon excretion, um, the group A received also a virtual follow-up. In fact, the patients of uh, group A adopted the virtual platforms that offered them an exercise plan, uh, nutritional behavior advice, and an eating plan. These tips uh, can be saved in a virtual library in this platform, which the patient can access and go back uh, at any time. Uh, this virtual follow-up platform offers the patient uh, a 24-hour service, which uh, the patient can register their weight and allow a comparison with previous data. So as we can see from, uh, from the graph, uh, the blue column represents uh, the uh, calorie intake of the patient and the red column uh, represents uh, the calories recommended by the nutritionist. In this way, the difference between the two is very clear and highlighted for the patient to observe. And uh, this uh, virtual uh, communication doesn't uh, substitute the physical meeting, but is only a complementary service to underline eventual critical aspects that could, could require attention. Uh, these are our results. 20 patients, 5 males and 15 females with an average age of 36 years were followed for, for 12 months after the lip placement. And uh, during the lip treatment, patients recorded an average weight loss of 16 kilos and an average reduction of five points of BMI. Uh, furthermore, the obesity correlated disability score decreased from 67% to 38% at, at the end of the lip treatment with a further reduction to 29% in group A that received both um, physical and virtual follow-up. On the other hand, group B that received only uh, physical follow-up maintained the same score achieved at the end of the lip treatment. And uh, uh, regarding uh, weight uh, profile at the end of the eight month of follow-up, uh, in group A, 12% of patients uh, had lost additional weight, 69% of patients maintained the weight loss achieved, and 19% of patients regained weight. On the other hand, in group B, uh, no patients uh, lost additional weight, 62% of patients uh, maintained the weight loss achieved, and 38% of patients uh, regained weight. By the analysis of the three-day food diary, we demonstrated that uh, at the end of the lips treatment, all patients uh, maintain the adherence to the prescribed diet. Whereas uh, at uh, uh, the end of the eight month of follow-up, uh, all ten patients in group A and only seven patients in group uh, uh, B uh, maintain the adherence to the, to the, to the prescribed diet. Uh, in conclusion, this pilot study demonstrates enhancement and maintenance of weight loss results over time using an innovative digital and virtual follow-up program in uh, patients treated with the lips balloon. And uh, this also resulted in an increase, in an important decrease in obesity-related uh, in obesity-related disability score um, in both group, but mainly in group A that received both follow-up, virtual and physical. This is the take-home message, an era of digital technology may lead to new applications in obesity management. Uh, this will involve greater frequency of checkups, both virtual and physical, um, greater flexibility, uh, taking away the need to travel, and greater patient involvement with real-time warnings of any critical events. This means that the patient is never alone, but he has a constant support, and this implies uh, a greater probability uh, of success in its treatment. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions to Dr. Ienka? Atkinson, United States. 
Um, those are really quite spectacular results, and there have been many, been many studies done with gastric blues in the past, and many studies done with telemedicine type things, um, and your results are much better. So a question that I have is, did you start out with only uh, 20 patients, or were there more, and these were the completers? Uh. No, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, uh, for this study, I treated only 20 patients, but uh, in my experience, I treated uh, approximately 70 patients with the balloon, but uh, um, uh, I treated uh, uh, with the virtual follow-up uh, only 20 pa patients because that is a, a very uh, uh, new, uh, new treatment, uh, new type of follow-up. And uh, my best result uh, with the patient uh, um, was uh, 30, uh, 30 kilos uh, with the balloon and the virtual follow-up. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Inyenko. Thank you. So thank you. We move on to the next talk given by Dr. Hjort about Prevotella to Bacteroides ratio predicts body weight and fat loss success on 24-week diets varying in micronutrient composition and dietary fiber. Long title. <laughs> <laughs> Long title. Now I don't have to say it. Okay, thank you for the, for the organizers to invite me to speak at this conference. My name is Mess Jort. Uh, I'm from the University of Copenhagen. I have a uh, conflict of interest or a potential conflict of interest, which is a pending patent application within the prediction of weight loss. And you could say that the framework of this presentation is personalized dietary management of obesity using patents within the gut microbiota. And I wrote existing in brackets because this is, um, in contrast to the previous speakers, really to use the existing knowledge, so to use the uh, current um, content of the, of the microbiota and not really trying to change it, at least not uh, now, maybe for later. So since the introduction of a high throughput uh, sequencing, researchers have looked for gut microbiota patterns, and the pattern that I'm going to talk about now is intratypes. So back in 2011, the microbiota of individuals was found to be clustered in three distinct um, groups dominated by different genera. And that was mainly Prevotella, uh, Bacteroides, um, and also Ruminococcus. And that was published in Nature and Science. Then a few years later, it was more a question of whether this was in fact discrete clusters or it was more um, a continuous phenomenon. Uh, nevertheless, research continued within this area, uh, and in, within the recent years, these intratypes have been found both to be biomarkers of food intake, uh, it has been associated with different diseases, and also found to be quite stable over time. So a given individual um, will very much, uh, will be likely to, um, to stay uh, the same intratype even through uh, dietary intervention studies. Then very recently, a prospective paper um, on this area came out, uh, suggesting that intratypes could in fact be used to stratify in prospective studies um, and randomized clinical trials, and perhaps also be used in personalized dietary interventions. So, um, uh, that I'm presenting here is from a publication uh, in 2014 uh, from our own research group, um, which is one of the studies showing that you are in fact using the Prevotella to Bacteroides ratio. You are in fact able to uh, put people into two discrete clusters, uh, one B type here, the Bacteroides, and P, uh, the Prevotella type. And also, um, this was a dietary intervention study, so 
the 60 people completing the study, um, 58 of those belong to the same intratype even after a dietary intervention giving more fiber and whole grain. And the two uh, people that changed into a type, one of those actually got antibiotics. So they are quite stable, um, which has been found in several studies. We then use data from this study, um, which, as I said, was a dietary intervention study, giving either a new Nordic diet, which is basically a diet uh, with more fiber and whole grain, uh, and it was compared to an average Danish diet which is uh, like a Western diet. Um, what we did was to stratify these two groups uh, based on pretreatment intratypes. And what we saw was that the Privatella intratype here, they lose three and a half kilo more during this half a year if they consume the new Nordic diet um, compared to the control diet, the Western diet. Whereas the oxyroidus intratype, regardless of the diet, they lost exactly the same amount of weight. And actually this was a study where all the foods were supplied free of charge from a specially designed supermarket at the university campus. So what we normally see um, after an intervention such as this, when we follow people up for a year, we will start seeing uh, weight regain and that was exactly what we saw in this study. After the intervention study, they were advised to consume the new Nordic diet, all of them. And what we saw in, all, in three of the four groups, at least, was weight regain. But what was striking was that the one group that actually lost the least, which was the Privatella intratype that we just learned would benefit from fiber and whole grain, but didn't really receive it the first half a year, when only giving advice for them to eat more fiber and whole grain, they actually start losing weight. Okay. So this is simply another way of showing the same. We have the B type, the P type, and this is the difference between the two diets, as I just showed you, no difference. Whereas for the Privatella intratype, a difference of three and a half kilo. So once we saw these results, of course, we wanted to try and validate this in other studies. And we found a study suitable uh, for that in our own research group. So this on top uh, here is simply the original publication. Um, they had the microbiota composition from baseline um, and they had dietary uh, recordings during half a year. In fact, it was a randomized controlled study, but the only difference in the two arms was the calcium intake. Um, so, I mean, we had no hypothesis that that should affect uh, the intratypes, um, and it didn't, but I'm not showing that today. Um, I'm merely treating this data set as an observational study. And the bottom publication here is um, the title of my presentation today. Uh, and it was just published a few weeks ago in IGO. So this is um, the study uh, where we did exactly the same uh, as the previous study I presented for you. We took the Privatella to Baxoroidus ratio and it was somewhat um, categorized uh, into two uh, different intertypes. We have three people here, some, somewhere intermediate uh, the result didn't really matter whether uh, they were put in one or the other box. And then here's the baseline characteristics of the population. We have a, a third group that I ghosted um, because I will not really talk about that today. That's a group where there were no detectable Privotella bacteria. So it's not really possible to take a ratio um, and they somehow differ from those having low Privotella. I will not go into that uh, discussion now, but only really focus on the Privatella uh, intratype over here and the Bacteroides intratype. And we see that the Privatella intratype, at least in this study, they weigh more uh, at baseline. So uh, age, gender, and BMI uh, has been adjusted for in, in the analysis. And this was the weight loss after half a year in the two groups. So the Privatella intratype lost 3.8 kilo more, 
and in fact it was uh, exactly uh, 3.8 kilo fat mass as well. So this was without taking into consideration the diet. So then when looking at the, in this case, self-reported dietary intake uh, during the uh, half a year, um, we saw that overall, um, as expected, an overall uh, negative correlation between fiber intake um, and weight loss. So meaning that more fiber intake, uh, more weight loss. When um, stratifying on the arthritis enterotype and patellar enterotype, we saw that, yes, a negative correlation, um, not significant, uh, maybe borderline significant, but, but what was even more important was that for the privatella enterotype down here, we saw, which is the black line, the black dots, we saw a quite amazing correlation between um, self-reported fiber intake um, and 24-week weight loss um, of minus 0.84. And actually when adjusting for baseline BMI um, and the other macronutrient composition, it was as much as uh, minus 0 0.9. So giving the results in a different way, we found that consuming below the median of fiber intake reported in the study uh, compared to above the median, there was a striking uh, almost nine kilo difference between uh, those individuals. Whereas up here, it was less than three and not significant. And of course, we also looked into the other macronutrient uh, intake, so fat, carbohydrate, uh, protein, and also total energy intake. Um, again, self-reported. And I won't go into details uh, with this now, but merely sh uh, highlight that it seems for the privatella interotype, that's really, uh, that's the black lines, that's really where you see the slopes, so meaning that for the privatella enterotype, somehow the dietary composition um, has a greater effect on the ability to lose weight compared to the blue lines, which are flat all over, meaning that, at least in this study, um, it seems as the macronutrient composition does not really matter for the ability to lose weight for the bacteroides enterotype. So that brings me to my conclusion, which is that weight loss on a high fiber diet is, is specific or at least almost specific to the privatella enterotype, which I just showed in two independent studies. But also that weight loss options for the bacteroides enterotype is less clear. So I mean, it doesn't mean that a bacteroides enterotype cannot lose weight, but it's just that we haven't identified any diet that is particularly effective for that group. But I would like to uh, highlight a study that I haven't had the time to talk about, uh, a recent study where um, Akabos, uh, type two diabetic drug, um, improved glucose metabolism specifically for the bacteroides enterotype, uh, just highlighting that there might be also dietary alternatives for that group. And then uh, at the very end, I'll just highlight a paper we just submitted, um, talking about or dealing with all what I have talked about uh, today in a much, much more detailed way. Yes, and then I would like to thank all the collaborators on this work, especially uh, Professor Arne Astrup. And then my talk is done and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. We have one question here, please. François Pralon, I'm an endocrinologist in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, am I right in, in understanding that the Prevotella group is the one that rebounded in weight the most? And if yes, would you comment on that at the end of the diet? They had the at most weight regain? Um, at the end of the diet, um, At the end of the diet, all the different groups regained weight. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the one the here. Um, yes, you see here that the, the bacteroides groups, they regained weight quite dramatically. Um, and you're right, all of them are uh, encouraged still to consume 
a new Nordic diet rich in, in fiber and whole grain. The group that didn't but have the benefit of it lost weight. The group down here that benefit of the new Nordic diet, they also regain weight. Um, I guess they might be a bit tired of the diet. You don't uh, know what they did with the diet. You, 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 you don't know what they did with the diet after the 20 uh, No, we don't have dietary recordings. It was only um, giving advice to follow this diet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, what, what do you think is the mechanism behind that finding? Do you have any idea? Um, I mean, the mechanisms could maybe be, I mean, it has been shown that Privatella and Bacteroides, um, they somehow ferment the same substrate in a different way, so maybe um, we have a great uptake of short-chain fatty acids, um, uh, maybe particular ones, <laughs> that might somehow influence uh, satiety. So that's at least a working hypothesis now. Okay. So thank you again. <laughs> so we move on to the next talk, which is enrichment of health associated gut bacteria after short term dietary intervention in elderly obese subjects. And it will be given by Dr. Cancello from Italy. Thank you, moderators. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks also to, for the opportunity to present uh, our work today. First of all, my disclosure. I want to say that I have nothing to disclose. The context of our study is the gut microbiota. We all know that gut microbiota is a highly dynamic system. And there are several factors that are able to shape, to modify this fine ecosystem as, as uh, diet, the environment, the lifestyle, the antibiotic treatment, as well as different uh, pharmacological treatments, as well as stress. In the adult, the microbiota is dominated by taxa belonging principally to big families of bacteria, the Bacteroides and the Firmicutes phyla. And in obesity, there was reported firstly an imbalance between these two big families, with an increase in Firmicutes and a decrease in Bacteroidetes. But it's not so simple, the, 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 the pattern of gut microbiota in obesity, because also we have uh, recent data concerning also uh, an important decrease in richness in biodiversity of several family of bacteria. More than that, uh, we have also to take in account of the effect of aging in the shape of uh, this fine ecosystem, because uh, the, the aging is a physiological process, but uh, uh, there are studies showing that uh, during aging we have uh, a physiological decrease in the amount uh, of the bacteria and the healthy aging as well as the longevity are, were associated to a uh, preservation of the richness of the diversity uh, of these bacterial strains. So since obesity is a chronic relax, relapsing disease, uh, we now probably face more and more to obese patients in, uh, in advanced uh, ages. So we, we decided to study and to compare the intestinal microbiota in elderly obese subject with that of elderly non-obese lean healthy subjects to study, uh, to study the microbiota modification in elderly obese um, after a short-term uh, balanced hypocaloric diet to induce uh, weight loss and also to assess uh, the effect of a probiotic supplementation mixture commercially available on, uh, together with the diet, of course, to in a gut microbiota composition and uh, to check also at the variation in the clinical parameter at a systemic level. This is the flow chart of our study. We collected 26, we enrolled 26 obese patients and, of course, we excluded uh, all the situation that could uh, make uh, a bias in the data interpretation as bariatric surgery procedures, inflammatory bowel diseases or cancers, and also the therapy with antibiotics, probiotic vitamins, PPI, and as well as metformin in the case of diabetic patients. So the fecal samples, to avoid uh, uh, additional bias, where we ask it to the patient to collect uh, at home uh, the basal fecal samples that, con that we consider at the T0, and we compared these fecal samples with the samples from 15 elderly non-obese controls. 
And then our, at the hospital, so in, during the hospitalization, we submitted our patient to 15 days of diet and the following 50 days, the diet plus a probiotic supplementation. All the fecal samples uh, collected were analyzed by sequencing. Here I'm showing the characteristic of our population studied. So the mean age was 79 years. We had a high level of obesity, and you can see an excess of fat mass. And at clinical level, the major complications were orthopedics and the cardiovascular. Uh, we, uh, we had also patients with OSA, and uh, more than half of the sample declared uh, uh, chronic constipation. We tried to uh, characterize the morphology of the fecal sample by the Bristol stool uh, chart, and all the samples were in between type 3 and type 4 um, morphology. That was in agreement with the, the assessment of calprotectin, fecal calprotectin, that uh, it is a protein and marker of uh, an inflammatory state of the gut, uh, of the intestine. Then uh, uh, some uh, information about the, concerning the diet we performed uh, during the hospitalization. It was uh, a balanced uh, diet. Here you can see the composition in micronutrients, uh, in carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and this followed the recommendation of the Italian Society for Human Nutrition, recently revised. And this is the supplement we used. It's a commercially available mixture of uh, probiotics, and we decided to use this product because of the richness in bacteria, 450 billion of bacteria, and also for the different strain. We have several strains of Lactobacillus and Bifidobacteria, as well as Streptococcus thermophilus, that is in different uh, mixture of uh, supplementation. Uh, here I'm showing the changes in food uh, consumption before and during hospitalization of our patients. Of course, at the hospital, we increase the assumption uh, of vegetables and also of whole grains and cereals instead of uh, white bread or pasta, we regulated the amount of fruit, of daily fruits, uh, and increased uh, as protein level, uh, the legumes uh, cons uh, cons assumption, and also the eggs, uh, reducing cheese and meat. Of course, at the hospital, wine was not allowed. And uh, the average daily water intake was uh, followed the recommendation. This is the baseline comparison in uh, elderly obese and obese control. It is immediate to see that two groups are well separated, and in red you see the obese, and in green the elderly and obese control. And we also uh, have observed that uh, the obese patient had a lower biodiversity, that this biodiversity decreases at the increase in body mass index. This is the detail of this uh, previous uh, comparison uh, between obese and non-obese control elderly. And uh, as you can see, we had an increase in streptococcace, colincelle, peptostreptococcace. The lactobacillace was not really significantly different, and they were, the, there was a significant decrease in Blausia, coprococcus, roseburia, and parab parabacteroidetes that are all healthy associated bacteria. So this picture show that also in elderly obese, we have typical alterations obesity linked. This is the effect of our intervention after uh, the two weeks of diet and two weeks of diet plus uh, the probiotic, and we had a good uh, decrease in calprotectin, in fecal calprotectin, and uh, the weight loss was globally uh, the 2.5% of the initial weight that uh, it's a uh, satisfactory uh, uh, weight loss uh, uh, if considering that we are working with elderly uh, obese patients, so the risk of the loss uh, of free fat mass, it is very, very high. And the effect of the intervention of microbiome diversity is shown here. And as you can see, at this stage, we cannot distinguish the three points, uh, the basal, uh, samples uh, after two weeks of diet and two weeks of diet and probiotic supplementation. But uh, there is a shift of yellow point and orange point uh, on, the, on the left uh, of the skin. That means that we have increased the richness, the diversity of intestinal bacteria 
in this sample. And the first, the, the more patient uh, that shift on the left were after the two weeks of diet. This is uh, the detail of this analysis. We increased the bacteroidace and coreobacteroidace. Uh, there was a significant decrease in enterobacteriace, enterococcace, and the verruco microbiace increased, and Ackermansia mucilifila belongs to this group of uh, bacteria. And as expected, the lactobacillus increased only with the supplementation that was also an expected result. At clinical level, we had globally an improvement in all the um, metabolism, uh, glucidic and lipidic metabolism in these patients. And um, I, I don't have the time to show all the details, but we had an interesting, significant increase in the redox potential in this patient with the uh, increased amount of glutathione reduced and uh, um, the glutathione reduced the oxidated uh, ratio. So we improved uh, mainly with the supplementation the potential redox. The correlation part of the study with all the clinical features we have uh, and also with diet uh, the frequency uh, is still in progress, but I want to show the principal correlation we found and uh, uh, stressing the point that is the body mass index, the, the big driver of uh, gut uh, dysbiosis, as you can see here with an increase in enterobacteriace and a decrease of erucomicrobiace. Interestingly, also the ratio of uh, redox potential of glutathione was related to uh, the decrease of uh, unhealthy bacteria and uh, as well as the, the increase in adiponectin and leptin levels were significantly related to movement of these healthy, unhealthy bacteria. So, in conclusion, uh, the gut microbiome in elderly obese subjects show typical features of dysbiosis as for all the obese people. The lower diversity in the obese compared to the non-obese is maintained also in advanced age. And in elderly obese subject, a recovery of health promoting gut microbial configuration could be rapidly obtained by a short-term balanced hypocaloric diet that I want to call Mediterranean-like, but we have to better define what this type of diet is. And the probiotic supplementation induced a decrease in the oxidative stress that is important to face off several mechanisms of oxidation at cellular level. And uh, of course, for the future, a longer follow-up is needed to verify the stability of this improvement because, uh, of course, we check at the patient for one month and uh, to see if, uh, if this improvement is, uh, could be obtained with, uh, in longer follow-up. First, at the end, uh, let me thank all the people involved in this study, in particular all the clinicians and biologists of the San, uh, San Giuseppe Hospital in Piancavallo of the Istituto Oxologico Italiano, and all the team of Patrizia Brigidi in, at the University of Bologna for the support in uh, microbe characterization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Are there any questions? Maybe I ask you what, uh, do you have follow-up data on these patients? What happened after this? Diet? Yes, unfortunately not. But uh, we want to, um, to check also this patient at uh, the follow-up because we plan usually uh, a check, uh, um, a check up every three months after uh, the, the recovery at the hospital, uh, after the hospitalization. So we have to do that, I, I agree. What do, you, what do you think would be when you continue with the probiotic uh, treatment and um, in, well, regardless of diet? What, what about the composition this, of bacteria? This particular probiotic mixture is probably the probiotic mixture with a, a big amount of literature and uh, scientific studies. The probiotic itself does not improve weight loss without a diet. This is a, a well known. But uh, I think uh, it's a powerful tool for, uh, re to re-equilibrate uh, uh, other, other uh, patterns and uh, other metabolisms. Thank you. So we now move to the last talk of our session.
and its early achievement of significant weight loss with naltrox or bupropion is associated with additional weight loss and improved glycemic control at one year in patients with type 2 diabetes and will be given by Dr. Halsevsky, please. All right, I'd like to start by just thanking the organizers for inviting us to present this data as well as uh, to you all for staying here. I think lunch is right after, so really appreciate your attention. Um, let's see. And just starting with the disclosures, so three of the authors, as you can see, are current or former employees of Erection Therapeutics, and the two others have, we have worked with quite a bit over the years. So when you think of the, the regulation of food intake, one way to think of it is just to conceptualize it in terms of homeostatic and hedonic pathways, with the homeostatic pathways primarily being um, regulated through the, the hypothalamus. We sometimes consider that the hypothalamic hunger system. And then you can think of the hedonic uh, more being regulated through the mesolimbic reward system. And so the combination of naltrexone and bupropion has been shown in animal models to have activities in both of these systems to reduce food intake. And that's also consistent with feedback from patients or, or subjects in the clinical trials who do report um, reductions in hunger, uh, improvements in their ability to re resist cravings, and also an overall improved ability to control their eating. So naltrexone bupropion, I'll, I'll refer to it as NB just because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's approved now in, in many countries, both Europe, the US, um, Canada, South Korea, and some of the Middle Eastern countries um, as an adjunct to reduced calorie diet and increased physical activity. Um, you can see the BMI categories for whom it's approved. And the, the main bulk of evidence for its approval came from four phase three studies and um, those have all been published previously. We've also gone and tried to look at um, things that predict long-term response. And as is true with, with most weight loss agents, the best predictor of long-term response seems to be short-term response, so the early responses. Um, and we've published um, in 2016 a pooled phase three analysis, looking at the early responders here defined as those who lost 5% or more of their body weight by week 16. Um, it turns out that just about a little over half of the patients who are randomized into the trials um, were responders by this definition. What's nice is um, those patients tend to stay in the trial, so about 85% of those stayed in the trial through a year. And the mean weight loss in that group of responders for those four pooled studies was over 11%. So one of the studies that went into that program is what we refer to as core DM. Or, and this was specifically conducted in patients with type 2 diabetes, as well as meeting the criteria for being overweight or obese. Now, if you look at the overall population for that study, they had a slightly lower mean weight loss than you saw in the other studies, as you would predict based on people with type 2 diabetes, with their mean weight loss for the NB group of 5.2%, 1.8% versus placebo. But what we wanted to do for this analysis was to go back and look not just at the weight for the responders specifically within the core diabetes program, but also look at the glycemic responses and, and see how they correlated in terms of um, improvements in the responders. And I should say, this is a really clinically important way of thinking about and looking at the data. Um, labeling throughout the world recommends that MBBD is continued after 16 weeks of treatment if patients haven't lost at least 5% of their body weight. So really, this is kind of the most clinically relevant um, population, we would say, for, for assessing what the outcomes look like. So CORDM, this was a phase three multicenter trial, um, 56 weeks in duration. All the patients um, receiving NB received the, the full commercial dose, as we would call it now, of the 32 milligrams of naltrexone and um, 360 milligrams of bupropion per day. And that's escalated over a four week dose escalation period. Now to get into the trial, the patients had to have an A1C of between seven and 10%. They couldn't have a fasting blood glucose greater than 270. And they had to either be not using anti-diabetes medications or on stable doses of oral anti-diabetes medications. So this trial actually wrapped up in 2009 or 10. So the, the medications that were included were sulfonylureas, metformin, TZD, and a handful of patients on uh, DPP-4 inhibitors. Unfortunately, we did not have anybody on SGLT2 inhibitors in this analysis. Um, use of injectable anti-diabetes medications was also not allowed, so no one on insulin or uh, GLP-1s in the study. And this is just a visual to look at the study design here. You can see a two to one randomization to NB versus placebo. Um, weight measurements essentially every four weeks throughout the study. Lifestyle counseling, which was conducted um, with some of the personnel from the study site, not, not necessarily a dietitian, 
but it was really recommendations to reduce their calories by about, about 500 calories a day, increase physical activity, um, behavioral tips and, and ways to try and accomplish those um, behavioral changes as well. And then you can see just periodic measures of HbA1c, glucose, and insulin. Um, we did have procedures in place in case people's HbA1c um, went too high for loss of glucose control where they could add rescue medications. And you can see the, the co-primary and secondary endpoints here, very standard for obesity trials with a couple extra diabetes-related measures in there as well. So looking at the population here, if you're used to looking at phase three data from um, obesity trials, you can see it's a slightly different population, um, specifically when we went into this diabetes group, where we have an older age, about 10 years older than we would typically see with a, a mean age of around 54, and fewer females than we typically see. Across the whole um, core program, we had about 80 to 90 percent females. Um, approximately 80 percent female, mean age just over, or, sorry, <laughs> I was used to saying 80 percent female, approximately 80 percent white, um, a mean weight just over 100 kilograms, a mean BMI right around 36. Um, importantly for the, the diabetes population, specifically the mean A1C of 8 percent, and you can see the breakdown of the, the anti-diabetes medications that were used. Um, GPP-4 inhibitors was really just a handful of patients. Now in terms of subject disposition, um, I was really impressed with some of the earlier presentations that had very good subject uh, retention. Um, here you can see it was not as good, it was more in line with what you typically see um, in an obesity study with about half of the patients discontinuing treatment in the NB group and about 40 percent of the patients in the placebo group discontinuing. Um, the main reason in the NB group for discontinuation was adverse event, but even 15 percent of people in the placebo group discontinued due to adverse events. And then the, some of the other reasons that are more general and maybe having to do with lack of treatment satisfaction or lack of weight loss, you tended to see higher in the placebo group, so a few more insufficient weight loss and kind of some withdrawal of consent type um, reasons for withdrawal. Now in terms of safety and tolerability, um, the most frequent adverse events you can see here um, primarily gastrointestinal related, and if you compare this to what's seen in sort of the patient population that doesn't have diabetes, these all tend to be a little bit higher in incidence, um, and we think that's really due to an interaction with metformin. It just tends to boost the, the incidence of a lot of these adverse events a little bit. Um, but you still see a relatively, um, you know, of the 40 percent of patients who had nausea, um, only about a quarter of them led to withdrawal due to this nausea, and you can see 3 percent, 1 percent for um, vomiting and headache. Okay, so getting to the weight data, I'll walk you through this. I know there's a lot of data on this slide. So first of all, this is just weight loss over time. So this is for all of the placebo subjects here. This is for all of the NB subjects here using a, a last observation carried forward analysis. And then the lower line here, you can see the weight change over time in the NB patients who are the early responders, that is those who had 5 percent weight loss by week 16. Um, and looking then at the data for the people who completed, you can see they're just, their similar pattern just shifted down a little bit again because this is the patients who are the compliant with the treatment throughout the whole study. And if you then look at the percent that had 5 percent weight loss at week 16, you can see um, 24, 53, and 80 percent across those same three groups. And what's nice to see is 88 percent of the NB responders did continue on treatment through week 56, and that's compared to about 70 percent of the patients otherwise. Um, if patients do discontinue, it tends to happen earlier. But even so, those who are tending to lose more weight, probably more satisfied with treatment, also tend to want to stay on treatment and stay on the studies. Um, switching to glycemic parameters, if you look at HbA1c and glucose, you see kind of a stair step down here in terms of the, the change in fasting glucose for the placebo, NB all, and NB responders. And then in terms of HbA1c, it's a 0.1 percent, 0.65, and then a 1 percent A1c reduction um, on those who are the responders. You see kind of a similar pattern here if you're looking at fasting insulin or HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance, where you see not huge differences between the placebo and NB all group, but then when you look specifically at that NB responder group, you see about a 25 percent decrease in fasting insulin and about a 35 percent decrease in insulin resistance. So again, just consistent with the more weight you can take off of a patient with type 2 diabetes, the more improvements you see in, um, in insulin and insulin resistance. Um, across the whole program, we tend to see most consistently reductions 
in triglycerides and waste circumference, and then increases in HDL cholesterol. And you see the same pattern here when you're looking across the three groups. Um, and then LDL cholesterol, if it does change, it's not consistent and um, kind of tends to hover right around baseline, and we see the same pattern here. So you can see with HDL placebo, NB all, NB responders, kind of again, uh, greater increases in HDL as you move into that responder group. Um, the triglycerides, you don't see too much more of a reduction when you look specifically in the responders versus all. And then the waist circumference being highly correlated with weight, you, you see the, the pattern here. So in conclusion, the patients with type 2 diabetes that were treated with NB that achieved 5% weight loss by week 16 had additional weight loss and improvements in glycemic parameters compared to the overall uh, NB treated population. Um, and you know, it was about 40% of the type 2 diabetes subjects who did meet these criteria. So a slightly lower percentage than what we saw in the overall population, which was 50-ish percent. But um, in these early responders, I think it's still pretty impressive that we were able to get a mean weight loss that exceeded 9%, as well as an HbA1c reduction of, of 1%. Um, and then the majority of early responders did continue on to the study end. And so I think this supports the use and the importance of that week 16 criteria in clinical practice to look to predict longer term outcomes um, in patients. And finally, I think kind of the bigger picture, when we think about treating type 2 diabetes in patients who are overweight or obese, you know, the first step in most treatment algorithms is diet and exercise. But it's almost like a checkbox, like, okay, yeah, diet and exercise, let's move on to the, the diabetes drugs. And I think this kind of data could um, make one think a little bit more about trying to do diet and exercise in the best way possible, and perhaps supporting those dietary changes with a medication that's designed to do just that and that may end up having some um, important treatment outcomes for those patients. So with that, I'll think, take questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? I can ask a question, Please. perhaps. Um, I noticed that you didn't show uh, the response, the, the, res the responders on placebo data. And I was kind of curious about that, yeah. because with the lorcaserin, uh, they also showed that the guys on the um, uh, drug that were responders did very well, but when they checked the responders and the placebo, they pretty much did as well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, with any lifestyle intervention, you'll always have some subset of patients who will do, who will respond even without the drug. Um, and I, I don't have the data for this subgroup of patients specifically, but I know that for the overall phase three population, it was about 19% of the patients were week 16 responders compared to 51. What's interesting though, if you look over time in the placebo responders, so they're the ones that did really well for the first 16 weeks. And then what you see when you look at the curves over time, the NB responders tended to keep having a reduction in body weight, whereas the placebo responders tended to kind of lose their steam and maybe even regained a little bit of weight over time over those remaining 56 weeks. Um, but yeah, that data is published in the uh, Fujioka paper as well for the whole study. But yeah, so you can just get more patients to be successful using a medication, I think is the key. Sure. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, I would like to thank the speakers, the audience on behalf of my co-chair. Have a nice stay.